Okay. Well, I have one o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to everybody, and thanks for joining us today uh, as we give some information about our uh, transportation projects database and our online application system that we are looking to upgrade. My name is Jennifer Barnes, and I am a program manager in the transportation planning department at PSRC. And I oversee the side of our uh, of our work program that really deals with the the, the project side of things. And so, uh, a, a lot of the all of the databases that we're going to be talking about today kind of supports our work related to projects. Uh, so, just a quick. Maybe. How's that? There we go. Uh, so just uh, we have a very simple agenda today. We'll do a, a quick round of introductions for our staff who are on this meeting. Uh, I will give a, a brief overview of the transportation work program. There's a lot more detail about this in the RFP itself. Uh, then uh, we will spend some time, Miles on our staff will spend some time uh, demonstrating uh, or either just showing you some of our uh, pieces of our database and in our online application form. And we are expecting to uh, leave a, a fair amount of time for, for questions for your questions. Um, so we would like uh, to, I'd say if you have a question for clarification, please uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand. Please use the raise hand function in Zoom uh, to ask that. But for the most part, would appreciate if you uh, just hold off until we get to the Q&A portion of our, of our meeting uh, to, to ask your questions. Um, but before we launch in, uh, I said I've introduced myself, so let's have our staff go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves. Um, and maybe we'll go... Uh, Chris, Mitch, Miles, and Alexa. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Chris Peak. Um, I am a database developer slash administrator um, at, at the agency. Um, I've been working in this position for about four years or so, but um, and I'm not in the transportation uh, section of the uh, of the agency um, anymore. But I spent many years. Um, Working under working in transportation on the with the system that we're we're looking to upgrade. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with most of the ins and outs of it currently. Um, yeah, I guess I'll pass, that's I'll pass it on to the next person. Go ahead, Mitch. Hello, I'm Mitch Cook. I work with Jennifer in the transportation planning department. Um, I work heavily with um, the region's local agencies to ensure projects are um, moving along um, with the necessary timeline and ensuring um, we're using the, or sorry, ensuring we are um, collecting and recording the data uh, that we receive from these jurisdictions on these projects um, in a clean and concise way so um, our agency can access and share this data um, to the sponsor or to the agencies and um, across the public. Yeah, my name is Miles Steepleton. I'm an assistant planner. I also work on Jennifer's team in the transportation planning department. I work really close with Mitch on all the things that he just said. I won't repeat all of that because it's Pretty great. Um, I'll just add that the tools we're looking at today are the things that we both use pretty much every day um, in our daily workflow. Thanks, Miles. Hi, uh, I'm Alexa. Sorry that I'm off video, but um, I'm the administrative assistant for the transportation department as a whole. So I um, kind of work a little bit everywhere with everyone. Um, and I, I'm the one who set this up. So thank you. Thanks, Alexa. So I'm just going to give a really quick overview just to kind of set the stage for this discussion. Uh, so PSRC, Puget Regional Council, we are uh, the regional um, planning agency for transportation, land use, economic development. Um, we are made up of a membership of 
uh, the cities and towns and counties and ports um, that are all located within our four county region, uh, along with uh, state agencies who are also members. So we have, you know, we have a staff, you've met many of us, or you're meeting many of us today, or at least to those who do transportation. Uh, but we are governed by boards. We have an executive board. They are made up of elected officials, uh, representatives from our various members, um, you know, jurisdictions. And so the, 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 you know, the staff does a lot of the work, but ultimately approvals and things get reviewed and approved by the board. And so uh, that is very much part of our process. Uh, we are uh, under the federal law, federal rules, uh, the designated metrop metropolitan planning organization uh, for our region and the regional transportation planning organization um, by the statewide definition. So we do have uh, quite a few responsibilities, particularly under our federal mandate. Uh, and th these are described in the RFP, but the, the, the ones that intersect with our database and application system are, uh, as we had described and are listed here. The first is the Regional Transportation Plan. This is a long range plan for the region. It's updated every four years. It describes long, long range right now. Our, our RTP goes through the year 2050. So it, it identifies the uh, investments and policies needed to kind of achieve our um, our regional plan, regional plan, which is called 20 uh, Vision 2050. Uh, one part of the RTP development is the development of a regional capacity projects list. Uh, these are projects that are submitted by uh, jurisdictions that uh, we have thresholds. So some projects over the threshold, if, if they're over the threshold, they need to be submitted and reviewed by our staff and included on this list. There are projects, many, many projects that are that don't meet this threshold. They still uh, are, are implemented. They're just not part of the RTP. Uh, so the other, so that's our long range work that we do is uh, that that is associated with the regional transportation plan. Uh, the last one was adopted in 2022 and the next one will be adopted in 2026. So we're kind of halfway between them right now. Uh, the transportation improvement program is a four year program. And this is really the projects that are being implemented now. So these are, this is the, the region's list of projects that um, are funded. And uh, so before a project can move forward, if it has, uh, for sure, if it has federal funding, many projects with state funding, if they're considered regionally significant, they all need to be programmed into the TIP before uh, they can be implemented. And so we are the we are the keepers of the tip and uh, we have a whole process that that Miles is going to talk a lot more about uh, related to how we gather the information and uh, and maintain it. We also, as part of our responsibility as an MPO, are uh, tasked with uh, awarding federal transportation funds to projects. We do this through a competitive process and we have uh, so we have an application system that goes with that. Uh, there's a competition, there's a whole process that goes with that. And so the projects that at the end of the competition are will be awarded some federal funds. Uh, once they are awarded funds, they get programmed into the TIP because they have secured funding. So that is an interaction, an intersection there. Uh, projects that do not have PSRC awarded funds are also programmed into the TIP. So uh, you'll see that there's there's a lot of overlap, but this isn't uh, the same path for every project that we're dealing with. And then for projects that are programmed and that are being implemented, we also have responsibilities to monitor them and make sure uh, the projects that have the PSRC federal awarded federal funds that they're being uh, delivered at the time that they are supposed to be delivered. The federal funds are tied to rules on that. And so part of what our staff does in addition to programming the projects is tracking them after they've been programmed and just making sure that everything's on track and we have many processes in place uh, if a project is not on track, but that's part of our responsibility as well. And I'm just going to show this one last slide, and then I'm going to turn over to Miles to give some detail. But this, this really, this is very, very general. But and some of these processes are uh, 
<laughs> have different emphasis on the different steps, but this does show generally what, um, what our processes consist of. So they generally start with a sponsor. When I say sponsor, so this is usually a rep, a staff, technical staff from, from the city or the county um, agency that is uh, the sponsor of the project. They submit an online application. So this is whether it's a funding application or a TIP application or a regional capacity project application. They all of these processes start with with the submittal of an op, of an application, and that we do through our online system. Uh, our PSRC staff then transfers that information into a database. Some of that's manual. Some of that has been done with scripts, but uh, but it's not just a, a direct input of the application information into our database. PSRC staff then reviews all of the submitted information and uh, almost always we end up having some uh, coordination and back and forth with sponsors to make sure that the information in the application is complete. And so sometimes we need to clarify, sometimes we need to make sure gaps are filled, sometimes there needs to be corrections, but we have a review process uh, that, that happens with, within each of these processes. And, and so our staff works with sponsors to make sure all of the information is complete. And then as the information gets corrected or clarified, our staff generally makes those corrections and updates. We don't go back to an, any kind of application. Once the information is uh, ready to go um, and for all of the projects under whichever uh, process that we're working with, our staff generates uh, summaries or reports. Uh, before anything gets approved, it goes through or gets finalized, it goes through a board review and approval process. So some of our reports are generated to support that. Uh, and then once the board has approved whatever the, whether it be the updates to the TIP or the new RTP, uh, then that final information can be either posted and depending on what it is, sometimes it needs to be um, submitted to WashDOT. So this is just, to, this this is really intended to give you just a general, this is kind of how we do things in general, uh, but Miles is going to give you some details uh, that I think you all will probably be interested in as um, I expect with a more of a technical bent. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn things over to, well, maybe I'm going to stop sharing, but I'll pause. Are there any questions, I guess, on just this kind of overall framework that I have just presented that anybody wants to ask? Just a quick question. Hi, this is Vibor. What's the process uh, that you just shared, is that representing the online portal mostly, or is that tied to the online portal? Uh, the online portal is really the beginning of that process. Um, so that we we gather information through the online system, but then we move it into the into the database, and we we create whatever external facing information. So we we use the database, and we have various processes, but uh, but the online portal, the application system is really the 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 initial step in our process where where applicants submit information for whichever process it is we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just add that we're going to go over that in a bit more detail here in a couple of minutes too. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um, right. I have a question about the uh, application itself. Is it um defined as an object, as in a document? Is it a collection of metadata and multiple documents? Is it a collection of database records? Um, is there a definition is, of it? So I think that is also, I think we should let Miles, we should just go into Miles' um, okay. part because <laughs> you're asking questions that is our next part. So uh, I think we'll just let Miles take off here. All Perfect. Right. Good segue then. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to stay at a high level here for a minute, and then we'll get into more of the specifics of the technical systems that we use to facilitate these, these processes. This is not a diagram of the data flow, but more of a representation of the general life cycle that a project can take. That cycle can include as many, of three, as, many as three components, as you can see here, uh, all of which start with the sponsor submittal. Um, we'll talk more about that form, looks like, here in a minute. Um, like Jennifer said, RTP capacity projects serve to implement the policy goals outlined in our long-range planning documents and in the RTP itself. These are large, complicated projects with long completion timelines and that span well into the future. 
um, PSRC funding processes, which include a variety of FHWA and FTA funding sources, serve as a tool of implementation for both the R for the RTP and rely on RTP policies to guide the scoring criteria. Uh, PSRC funding processes um, vary dramatically depending on the source that's being distributed and the form through which it is being distributed. In addition to the regional competitions that we administer, there are countywide competitions and various set-asides from the main funding sources, and these all have different needs and requirements in terms of the forms that we produce. The TIP um, is sort of the last step. It serves to implement the projects outlined in the RTP and projects funded um, by the PSA, sorry, PSRC funding process. It also includes any federally funded or regionally significant projects in the area. Once PSRC funded projects are entered into the TIP, we continue to track the status of those projects until funds are obligated and the project is delivered. Um, like you can, there are a lot of arrows here, so you can see it's possible for a project to take every step shown here. You can create an RTP capacity project and then submit all or a portion of that for funding and then submit that funding into the TIP to exist as a project. Um, a project can also enter the process at any step a project applying for grant funds doesn't necessarily have to be in the RTP and a project entering the TIP doesn't necessarily have to have received grant funding or be in the RTP. Each step in this process sort of follows a very similar flow. This is sort of a similar diagram to what Jennifer was showing you a minute ago um, that is specific to the TIP process. And it's fairly typical of the process that a project goes through through all of these steps. We obviously start with a sponsor submittal um, with a request for a new project or to modify an existing project. And PSRC staff review of the project and do any necessarily follow up. Um, depending on the scale of those changes, we may update their records or ask them to resubmit the project, but there's no mechanism for us to make modifications to their applications directly. Um, once review is finished, the record is included in a submission to the PSRC boards and to WashDOT. Um, and then once it receives those approvals, it is posted in the regional tip and in the WashDOT state tip. Hey, Miles, could yeah. you, you just pause just a sec? I just want to kind of Ooh. repeat one of the things that Miles said to me. So those three boxes, TIP record, RTP record, grant application record, it, it is it is possible for a project to, if it's a big project, it, so when we say RTP, it needs to be in the RTP. That means it's above a threshold. I mean, we, all, we, we check everything for consistency, but if it's above a threshold, it needs to be explicitly in the RTP. That project may or may not apply for grant funding, uh, but at the, whatever point they have funding, then that project could go, could be programmed into the TIP. Uh, projects that don't need to be explicitly listed into the RTP could may or may not apply for our grant funding. So they could either be programmed straight into the TIP if they get funds from other sources, or they could be programmed after they receive funds that are administered by by um, PSRC. So just want to reiterate that there's of these three big buckets. Yeah, some projects may touch all of these. There's overlap, but they're not. Um, one is not included, you know, not what's one is not entirely inclusive of another. So and, and Miles did say that, but I feel like that's an important part of kind of what what we're dealing with. So I just wanted to repeat that. Thanks. Yeah. Miles. Yeah. And thanks, Jennifer. That was definitely very helpful. Um, and like while many of all the processes appear very similar to the tip process that's shown at the top of the screen, they are all varied. They include more or less follow up depending on the process. For example, the funding applications are first submitted to us as screening forms, reviewed by staff, and then returned to, with comments, and then resubmitted as grant applications, which we then review and comment on again before submitting materials to our boards. Um, PSRC administers at least one funding process every year, which made with major cycles every four years, and changes to those processes essentially every time that they occur. All the processes and all of these processes require at least one approval by a PSRC board or committee, like Jennifer highlighted before. Um, moving on to the technical systems we use to facilitate this process, um, we use a collection of technologies to com in combination to collect, store, and present all the necessary information to take a project through its life cycle. We start with a collection of web forms, and we'll look at an example of one in a moment that collects information from users when they submit an application. This includes information about the project, the user entering the information, and also any relevant attachments, maps, or funding documentation. Um, in addition to being stored in this online interface, we download these applications manually, both as PDFs that show 
essentially a printed version of the application and a tab delimited file. The tab delimited file can be used to import new projects while modifications are processed using the application PDF manually by staff. The network drives, sort of the next step in the chain, holds all the copies of these applications when we're downloading stuff from the sponsors' forms. This is where we save them with all their relevant attachments. And we also save any correspondence that we may make with sponsors over the course of our review. Um, using a Python script that loads the tab delimited file, new project requests can be automatically imported into the Microsoft SQL database while modifications are, to existing projects are completed manually by staff using the access project, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. The SQL database holds all the information collected in the web app sponsor forms, along with any comments made by staff during the review process. The SQL database also holds records tracking PSRC managed funds. These records are stored both in the database and tracked um, separately by staff in greater detail, process which we would like to unify as part of this project. Um, the access project provides an interface for PSRC staff to view posted and pending project information to make and view any to make view <laughs> to make or view any review comments and to create, update, and delete records and to produce reports. These reports are produced through a variety of means, most commonly using pre-built report functions in the access project, as well as SQL stored procedures and queries. Ultimately, the system works to collect information about projects um, from the project sponsors and the PSRC staff to present it in a variety of formats for a variety of uses as we move through the project lifestyle, life cycle. And as part of the review process, PSRC staff end up referring to as many as four of these separate sources of information. We're often seeking multiple items or files from each source, which can rather complicate the review process. Um, sort of the highlights of this system is that it performs its key functions. We're not necessarily married to any of the way that this happens, but it is essential that whatever system we use to replace this can still perform all of these key functions. We also really like that our current system creates a really clear delineation between posted records and records with pending changes. Um, the system does have a few shortcomings. The sponsor interface is completely disconnected from the systems that PSRC staff use, which complicates the review process because sponsors aren't able to view project records when filling out applications, except by viewing posted project lists, which don't show the full project history and all the funds in the project. The system is also not especially searchable because information is stored in so many places, and often stored without consistent naming or folder schemes. Existing interfaces and existing interfaces provide poor search tools. Um, so it essentially requires proficiency with SQL to search for and summarize information. Um, there's a lot of manual data entry of information given to staff by sponsors, which is time consuming and presents a lot of opportunity for error. Um, and the nature of the database schema makes bulk modifications to projects challenging. Um, and they're also, we'll, we'll see this in a minute when we look at the specifics, but there are considered a number of legacy fields and features in our access project that we just don't use anymore um, that haven't been removed, which sort of makes the whole thing a bit clunkier. Luna, now if I can I'm gonna share a different screen now. If I can find it in a moment. Um, this is an example of a project application. So the several, several online web forms used by project sponsors to submit new projects or modifications to existing projects. This, is the for, this form is used to collect information for our monthly tip modification process and for our biannual new tip process. It's the form we use the most. It collects information about the scope of work. Um, I guess we can see that here. It collects information about the scope of work from the sponsor, about the location of the project, about environmental documentation and local plan consistency. Um, so there are a variety of screens here that do that. We sort of ask the sponsor to go through one at a time. We start with questions about the scope of work, the improvement type and the functional classification. And we have um, plan consistency. Most critically, we collect information about the total cost of the project and the funding that will be used to provide, that we use to fund the project, as well as the sources of funds that will be used. Um, we use really similar forms maintained on the same platform for our funding competitions, um, for RTP projects, for, and for project monitoring. Um, we like that these forms can be modified as our needs change. 
but especially with these forms, we don't like that it's just rather difficult to modify forms we need and we're highly dependent on consultants to make those changes. It's not something that we're able to do in-house, which is something we'd really like. Um, we also like that the platform offers the ability to create dynamic forms, which is especially useful with funding applications when different projects in different categories might be shown different, entirely different criteria from each other. Um, the chief complaints that we get from project sponsors that use this form is that they can't see um, existing and historic project records when they're making project modifications. So when they make a modification to the project, we essentially ask them to give us both the before and after picture and they don't always have access to the complete information. Um, we're gonna take a look at the staff interface. We use the access project. And hey, Miles, um, I just wanna yeah. break it. The, the sponsor does not have access to the complete information, but we do. So yes. the way that gets reconciled is they ask us and we provide information if they don't have if they don't have good records of their of their own history. It looks like we've got one question there. Yeah. yeah, Jennifer Miles, are samples of the forms or screenshots of the forms, will they be made available uh, to us as well to, for reference? Um, I guess we weren't planning on it, but I guess we could make a screenshot um, available um, of some of these things. Uh, I mean, this video is going to be available, <laughs> so you'll be able to go back and see what, what Miles is showing you today. Um, how, many, how many different styles of forms do you have currently in the system? Um, active right now, I think we have four forms because the funding application form that we use is made inactive when we're not using it. Um, so we reactivate it and modify it as needed. But in reality, there, there are a number of, like, we essentially are recreating these forms on a regular basis, I guess. Um, so I don't think we have a specific number. Super, well, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. All right. So now we're looking at the at the access interface that we have, this, which is using this Metro, this King County Metro project as an example, has a bit of nice variety for us. Um, this is one of several interfaces um, that we have um, in the TIP access project. It's very similar to screens in the RTP access project and to the both TIP and RTP review forms, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, this, this screen offers us the ability to create, update, read, and delete records from the SQL database, but most of those changes are used, made using the review form, again, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. It's designed to, say, pro designed to display project information, including but especially the scope of work, which we can see here. We have the project description, the project location, the project termini, project improvement type, and this screen, I think, is one of the best examples of the sort of scope of legacy fields that we have in our current form. I would say everything that I'm sort of circling with my mouse here are not fields that we use on a regular basis. Um, the, the form also provides, um, gives us the financial information. It shows both the current project funding and the historic project funding. Pick this as an example because you, because you can see gray rows or historic records of either funds that have been removed or modified. So you can see this this first ungrayed out row is a, the second iteration of this source of funding where the funding was reduced um, from the previous version. And then in the grayed out row beneath it, this is a source of funding that previously existed but was removed. Um, and then the blue row demonstrates the obligation of funds. So all that to say that we have a variety of fund statuses um, that, we, that we need to display and that we look at here. Um, and then the form also shows us the project budget this is all information supplied by the sponsors um, as they're submitting their applications. And then finally, I'll show you here, we have the, a project change log that gives both a log of all changes made to the project and um, a log of all the review comments that we've made um, over the history of the project. Um, the project review screen is essentially identical to this, so I'm not going to show it up, but it serves as a mirror for the project display screen. It shows the same information, um, but it writes to a review version, a review copy of the database so we can keep parallel versions of the posted and pending versions. Um, and then once those versions are approved by the PSRC boards and by WashDOT, we push the modifications to the posted database. 
Um, we really like that the system gives such a full summary of the project information, that there's a really clear delineation between active and inactive records, that there's clear and effective separation of sponsored supplied information and of the different review versions and posted versions. Um, the comment system is a bit rudimentary um, and clunky. It's difficult to attribute comments to particular staff and to find a comment except by sort of knowing what you're looking for. Um, I just I saw Chris, you unmuted. Do you wanna jump in there? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. We uh, we have a habit on our team of, of talking about the posted database. Um, which is actually, there's not a separate database that we're talking about when we talk about that. It's just different tables within the same database that uh, that store the uh, the approved and posted information. So. All right, thanks for that. Yeah, very important clarification. Um, and now I'm gonna go into another form that we have in the Access Project. It's the amendment review form. This is the, the centralized presentation of staff review that we use in our monthly review meetings. So. We're going to get a look at last month's amendment notes a little bit. Um, the form displays a log of project changes um, that have been made as part of the amendment um, to help support our review process. It also presents a series of review categories. Um, so each of these columns is a review category. And again, pointing to the scale of um, the unused features here, we don't use all of these columns anymore. That's why they haven't all been filled out. Um, but we're, we're able to set a review status by different categories, and then also to make comments um, that can be viewed. All this project doesn't have any comments, but you can either see all of the comments in one location, or you can go by tab and view comments by category. Um, so if you wanna see why a project has an issue in a certain category, you can see it like that. Um, so it's a, it's a very effective system for, um, for us. It works well for our meetings. It has a few shortcomings mainly that we can't see um, project details from this screen. There are buttons that sometimes will allow us to open versions of the project review and display screens, but they aren't super reliable. It's a pretty old piece of software. It's difficult to make modifications. We can't make modifications to the project from the screen. So you're sort of jumping from place to place as you're checking review comments and then modifying the project. And it's difficult to manage large quantities of review or comments. Um, and to track correspondence. Um, there aren't any great examples in our current database, but you can imagine once you get past one or three different categories um, of comments for review, it gets a bit overwhelming. Once you get past one or two comments within a certain category, it becomes rather difficult to track. Um, so that's that. And then once the review is finished, we obviously produce a number of reports. And I'm gonna put a few on the screen and they're gonna be very small because I wanna show them all to you at once. The details of what's in each form is not especially important here. Um, just to see that we produce a variety of different um, reports in a variety of different formats. We rely on the Access Project and SQL queries and stored procedures to produce these reports. Um, these documents, um, especially these examples, are produced on a monthly basis as part of the TIP amendment process. These are the types of reports that we submit to our boards and to WashDOT to receive the approvals to post our amendments. And in addition to these types of regularly produced documents, we produce other reports and summaries, um, lists, um, and analysis of projects um, and project information on an as-needed basis, um, both for internal and external partners. Um, we, like, we like the way that these reports look, but they're, um, they're static reports. So once they're produced, um, they don't respond to updates in our database. And so we have to manually update or insert or remove pages as we make changes after we've started reviewing these physical reports. And these systems aren't especially, the reporting systems aren't especially easy or intuitive to use. Um, they're not easy or accessible um, for PSRC staff. And so the production of these documents has become a relatively specialized skill. Um, that's all I have here. I think I'm gonna turn it over to Chris for a couple comments and then open it up to questions. I'll stop sharing as well. Yeah, just real quick, um, I don't have a whole lot to add to what Miles just said, except to point out that um, since we want to, we're looking to upgrade the system or really to replace it, most likely with something completely new. Um, and one of the requirements is that we want to be able to to support to support it in house going forward. You know, after we after we get whatever system um, upgrade 
in place, we want to be able to make changes uh, both to the um, to like what kind of fields we might want to track at any particular time as as our business needs change, but also ideally we'd like to be able to apply security patches and things like that. Um, we don't have any uh, full full stack web developers in our staff at all, but we do have we have quite a few people who are pretty well versed in scripting um, and sort of data data sciencey types of um, of technologies. And we have quite a few people who are really interested in in learning new technologies. So um, if um, in whatever proposal we end up um, going with, um, not as the response to the RFP, but the actual final phase one uh, document, um, we're hoping to get a, an indication of like what kind of training we might staff will need to in order to support this sort of stuff going forward. Um, I think that's all I wanted to add in there. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, now we've got um, a fair amount of time to answer your questions or if you want us to revisit anything that Miles showed you or um, yeah, just uh, open it up for questions. I think we do have a fair number of people in here. So um, I think if you could use raised hand, um, I believe that's under <laughs> reactions. I'm looking for it here. <laughs> Um, but, uh, or just turn on your screen and we can, or turn on your camera and we can call on you that way. But, um, yeah, I'd like to hear your questions at this point. We did receive a few written questions. Um, if those questions aren't answered or asked again in this, well, actually the questions in this and any other, those questions that we've received in, um, via email and any additional that we get, uh, any responses, uh, we'll, we'll provide responses to those questions and we will send out to everybody who has um, basically registered with Liana and she has has your email address. So we'll, we'll be sending uh, our responses out to, to all of you along with any responses to any additional questions that come beyond what is asked um, in this meeting today. So any questions? Um, let's see, Nadia. Hi, uh, Nadia here. I had a quick follow-up question for Chris. So I know you just uh, described um, your preference for going with a solution that you guys could manage in-house. Um, could you elaborate that a, a little bit more? I just wanted to understand um, kind of the reasoning behind that and if you guys are still open to solutions that could still allow you to make updates on your by uh certain updates yourself um and provide regular security patches if, if that's something you guys would be open to um i think uh, i guess i'm not sure how uh how to come back um so we just to reiterate that we do have, uh, we've had um, other, the web application system that we have right now um, was developed um, with consultants help. And we've we found it problematic to um, whenever we want to update it, since we're, we, we end up being reliant on somebody else who we sort of outside of our control to, to keep it updated. It'd be really nice if we could, um, because our business changes sometimes happen relatively quickly, like without a whole lot of forewarning, we might need, oh, starting next week, we might need a new field in the database. If we could, if we had the capacity in in our organization to just add the field to the database and then make the changes to the front end um, web, whatever front end system we have, um, it would really be, be helpful to us to be able to make those changes quickly in house. Uh, does that answer your question? Or yes, that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, and uh, just a quick follow on: if you have any other exam, are there any other examples that you have of common updates that you guys make? Um, I, I know I heard new getting new fields 
like I, in the different forms is helpful. Yeah, go ahead. I, I can, I'm going to throw a little bit in here. So where we really run into this is with our funding applications. So mm -hmm. Miles didn't show the funding applications, but we do have these, we have funding competitions, a, a slight correction of what you said earlier, Miles, our major competitions are every two years, not every four years. Uh, but we have other we generally end up having some competition every single year, and then what we our big ones are every two years. Uh, but those app, the the questions on those applications sometimes the type a new type of funding source may pop up depending on something happens at the you know at the federal level, and there's funds now that we are responsible for allocating, and so we may have to kind of quickly put together some kind of um, process or competition to allocate those funds. Uh, our board determines what the criteria questions are. This is the, it's not a staff decision. And so we support that. But what happens is by the time we get through those kind of processes, a lot of the time it's a fairly quick turnaround to turn board decisions on either changes to our applications, like say update to a criteria question or, or, or just a new source of funding where we're gonna ask these questions, but not those questions. Uh, I would say that's our most regular, the, the tip is what we most regularly use. We don't change that frequently, but the, the funding applications uh, need to get tailored to each funding competition and need to be evolve as you know time evolves and policies change. And so having a system where our staff can just go in and say create a new application or make modification to a question on an existing application without having to kind of go through a major process and bring in a consultant. Uh, th that is, that I think is something that is, would be immensely helpful to us and, and just much more aligned with how, how our system works. Chris, do you have it? Yeah. Um, I'd say about probably 90% of, of the changes we, we end up wanting to make are just like what Jennifer said, like an additional field or rephrasing a question, adding a new question to our to our forms and to our database. But then um, occasionally we get things like something that recently happened was we wanted, uh, we were starting a, a new sort of competition and we wanted for each project sponsors were, were applying for, we wanted them to fill out two different versions sort of competing versions of, of applications and be able to copy their answers from one to the second one. Um, um, so that was a little bit of a different type of functionality than we'd ever had um, in, in our systems before. Um, so it, ideally we would be able to make um, different you know, changes to the actual functionality of the forms in that regard. Um, um ourselves i know there's a there's a threshold to like at some point things just get too complex you know, need uh some uh some outside help for it but um for as much as possible um we'd like to do those things yeah thanks chris yeah and so the forms so the forms say so the tip forms those tip applications that's a monthly process that there's a, you know there's going to be periodic updates we want to do with those that's i would say the same with the art with the regional transportation plan that those project submittals that happens on a major scale every four years prior to the next rtp update we do some minor updates in between um you know we're not we're not we might change or update that form you know, once within that four-year cycle. That's not a constant thing, but um, it really depends on the process. Our, so I, I would say our and the TIP is a fairly static application, but we do occasionally run into either something has changed or we're just saying, hey, the way we ask this question is not giving us, we're doing a lot of follow-up by the way we phrase this question. We want to change this question. So it really does just kind of depend on, on the form and um, the circumstances. Okay. That's super helpful. Thank you both for that uh, additional background. Um, I, one last question on that piece. Do you guys have any open applications on your website right now or an example that you could share of one of those? Just curious to see what that format looks like today. Like, are you talking about like a funding application? Yes. Or funding application. Mm -hmm. um, Miles could probably find one of those. It looks very, all of our applications, because they're all done in web apps, they all, they all look very similar, even though they're okay. going to different places. But 
That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. For Miles, sure. While you're doing that, um, we'll maybe go to the next question is Victor. Hello, my name is Victor. I'm from uh, Mestro Design. Uh, my question, uh, are you guys looking for something more off the shelf or are you guys looking for more custom programming to happen? Um, like in, in terms of the product that uh, you guys wound up selecting? We are open to what, we're, I mean, the reason we did this as an RFP is because we don't, we we want, we, we don't have a feel for all of the options that are out there when we really are looking mm -hmm. for um for a, a firm or, or somebody who can kind of help, you know, get very familiar with our system and um, have, let us know, you know, kind of give us some suggestions for here, here are things that, that here are your options. And, and I think right. it can have, I mean, so I'd say either whether that's in a consulting capacity where here's all your options. We, you know, if, if you're a vendor who have a, who has a package where you feel like, um, it can be tailored to fit our needs, our objectives. We, you know, we we encourage you to apply. We're not really, we're not tied to one or the other. We just want the reason we're asking for proposals is because we truly do want to hear, um, you know, different proposals for for the best way to approach this because um, and just know what kind of options are out there and uh, and you know, obviously we. We have some kind of time and resource um, versus, you know, and and knowing what what things cost and what what is our menu kind of on the the low end or the high end. I mean, th that's the kind of information that we're that we're looking for. Gotcha, gotcha. And it sounds like you guys want to take more of like a database first type of approach, um, where you update the database and all your changes kind of like flow downstream to your front end UI. I'm going to let our database guy answer that question to me. <laughs> um, well, I am a database guy, so I think of everything as, as, <laughs> uh, as database centric. So, um, but I think that's the model that we are currently using. Um, yeah. and so if there are alternatives that uh, we could easily adopt, um, we'd love to hear about those as well. Um, I would say that I probably are since our frame of reference is very already uh, databasey, and we have quite quite a few people with database skills on staff. That um, that's uh, something to take note of, I guess. But it doesn't necessarily mean to mean it has to be uh, be that kind of framework. I, I I guess I would like to just also add we didn't emphasize this. This was in Miles' initial graphic. Uh, a big thing that we do with our database is also this tracking and monitoring. Um, so, th and this isn't tied to our forms, but once all of these projects are say in the TIP database, we do a lot of be between just what we need to do to gather information to monitor projects that have current, you know, delivery obligations. Sometimes we get requests from board members or age or agency members of like what you know, what's the history of this funding that we've received mm -hmm. in the city at one time. So we use the database and, and we use um, SQL queries to kind of generally is our mainly how we gather information, but we really do rely on the information, particularly in the tip database for a number of applications that are just compiling information to answer questions from various stakeholders and, and, and members. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Okay, um, the next question, um, is it Hemant? He he I'm sorry, you can tell me how to pronounce your name, but please ask your question. <laughs> next question. Is the name says Himan Tamanth Kundeti Kunditi. I see the microphone off, but I'm not hearing anything. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, my name is uh, Hemant Kundeti. Um, I'm from Agria Solutions. Uh, we specialize in both uh, customized client web services applications as well as the off the shelf solutions, depending on the needs of the client, of course. I'd like to ask two questions. Uh, one is uh, how many users, uh, how many staff? Because it says the RFP says both users and staff. Uh, that's one question. The second question I have is 
you uh, there there is a preference there is a preference mentioned of a system um, that comprises of uh, something else that that is not part of what what your uh, the the system that you have right now with your forms web based forms your internal uh, forms that you have that you fill out and then your database sql database that you have so there was some uh, i'm trying to find uh, the area where you were asking about a preferred system is there something like that additional to the rfp uh um, well, I, I'll answer your first question first, and then okay, we need to get a little more information about what you're asking in your second question. Um, so we, uh, the staff, I would say, are you're looking at most of the staff who actually utilize. I'd say our our staff that kind of utilize the database is, um, you know, <laughs> internal is, you know. 10, 10 ish, like in that. Uh, I mean, we, we have some folks on my team, some other folks on Chris's team who um, can navigate that, but we have a fairly um, small specialized staff in house that are the regular users of this database. We, we certainly get inquiries uh, to our, to our internal staff to produce from some of the, you know, the directors and um, managers, but it's a fairly um, small staff with the kind of the technical knowledge to actually navigate the database. On the user side, the users are really all of our member agencies. And so we've got 80 some uh, in our region between the cities and the counties and the state and uh, the ports um, and others. So um, each, the way the web apps works now is each of our member agencies has their own unique login and password that we provide to them uh, so that they can access our system and, and, and our staff is the keeper of that. So um, there's kind of a convention to it. So most of them know what their access credentials are. If they don't, we have, you know, we have contact on our website so that we can provide that information. But that's the that's the magnitude of the users. Um, and the database itself isn't, I mean, it's very large in the fact that there's a lot of projects going on there, but you know, we're talking about, you know, active is in the hundreds and historical is in the thousands. We're not talking about, you know, millions of records in our database. So I think that's another, you know, there's a lot of overlap and interaction between them, but um, but it's not from a, I, I would say, a database standpoint, a, a you know, a massive database. Um, no. So, Chris, were, I think you were agreeing with me there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It won't be getting tons of traffic. Um, yeah. Uh, the the second one, the question is uh, in the RFP. It says a system is also preferred by PSRC staff that can update forms and analysis uh, tools as they are needed. So is it an additional system we are asking or is it the system itself allows the staff to update forms and analysis tools as needed? I think that gets back to the earlier question about what exactly, um, how we would want to be able to configure it, um, you know, going forward with our in-staff uh, resources. Um, so um, we currently we use, uh, we can do some changes to our current system, like adding fields here and there in the database and in our access front end, of course. Um, and we definitely want to keep up with being able to support that kind of thing in-house um, and also be able to update the uh, the 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 public facing front end. Um, does that can I answer your yes, uh, that sounds more? good. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next question is John Bob. Bab. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. John Bab uh, with uh, Triskel Software Solutions. Um, I heard a couple of uh, keywords there that I just wanted to see if we could get some clarification on as far as preferences. Um, we we're saying uh, patching and self, like, is there a preference towards self hosting versus a cloud provider? Um, is the expectation that it is an in-house hosted solution? And if so, what kind of uh, operating systems are you running? Um, 
There's I wouldn't say there's a preference to in-house. Um, in fact, we have not um, hosted like a public facing uh, web service to my knowledge within our within our like own firewall that anybody on our staff has really supported. Um, this is not really directly answering your question, but we do have, so we are, um, our organizations, maybe 60 or 70 people, I think, um, we have really one IT support person who deals with the cloud infrastructure, all the networking, um, new computer purchases, like anything regarding um, what most people, what I would consider the umbrella term IT is supported by one person. So we are a little limited in some, in terms of staffing um, uh, that re in that regard. So if we, were to, if we say we wanted to put um, put up a, a new in-house web server um, within our firewall that's gonna be uh, uh, accessible by, uh, by the outside world, um, uh, that would be something we would want to figure out. So we should definitely okay. uh, learn what sort of requirements would be involved in that. Um, are there are there any preferences towards a uh, a cloud provider? Uh, I wouldn't. I don't know if there are preferences. We do currently use AWS for our uh, for our network for our our file system networking. Um, so as an agency, we are. Uh, in the AWS world, but that's not, uh, I wouldn't say that's a requirement. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, any uh, security constraints or um, we're, we're not getting into any kind of like HIPAA, personal information, identifiable since, issues? Yeah, we're, since we are a, like a, a public agency that as everything we do is really, um, subject to uh, uh, to public disclosure. Um, anybody can make a request for our anything that happens in our in our organization, really at any time. Um, I don't think that there's too much in the in the way of that, uh, especially not with the tip or with transportation data. Definitely not. Okay, great. Uh, that, no, uh, I don't have any other questions. Thank you very much. Before we get to our next question, Miles has indicated he's got a funding application open. So, Miles, why don't you just show that really quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like we said, it looks really similar to the TIP application. The main difference here is there tend to be longer forms with more questions. Um, well, slightly different. and it has criteria questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it so much longer. So we have all of the same information that we looked through here. Um, in the tip, um, on the tip screens, you have your basic project information, the contact information. This is a dummy project that Mitch put together, so um, that's why his name is on it. Um, and then there, and then we move into criteria questions um, that are that present a series of questions to the sponsor, and the questions that appear here will change depending on the identifying project information they give earlier in the form. Just going to click through a few of these screens. They all generally look like this: a series of short responses. There are some places where I'm not sure how I'm going to find one super easily, but there are some places where we ask for not just a short answer of information, but maybe um, a date or some other numerical field. Um, a few date examples here, and there are a few yes/no, true/false style questions as well. Um, but that that is essentially the the story here. I don't know if anyone. My, my, yeah. Could I ask you to to suggest you go to the air quality page on this? Oh, that is a very good point. Yeah. Um, so it's maybe good. just discuss how how that form feeds into other other uh, other yes. subsequent pages. Yeah. So we have. Um, so this is, I think, a great example of sort of how the forms change, and then I'll also talk a little bit about the air quality data too. I think. Um, so. Depending on the different elements selected here, you're going to see different fields appear below. So I'm going to go ahead and select them all and hit next. And we're going to see a bunch of new fields appear beneath, beneath here. Um, that depending on the elements they've selected, we have different questions about this. And then this information is used 
in a climate model that we run to sort of determine the tailpipe emission impacts of these kinds of projects. And it's especially important in our CMAC funding. Um, yeah, do you think there was anything else to highlight there, Chris? No, no, I just wanted to just demonstrate that functionality yeah. that yeah. you get different questions depending on the previous. Yeah, and then obviously if I come in and deselect some of these, well, those options will go away. And so, Miles, I think another maybe useful thing here is that if, if you go down to the financial portion of this, the the beginning of the funding application and the end of the funding application look very similar to what is programmed if say this project were to receive funding their tip application has has financial information in it it's got all of the project description information in it uh, the way our system is set up these are even though it's all in web apps these are two different processes so once a, if an applicant receives funding then they they don't transfer any of this information into the tip application then they would basically fill out an entirely you know as a separate process their tip application but it includes some of the same information that is included in their funding um, grant request yeah let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen now unless does anyone have any questions about this form before i close it because that's the people with hands up so it's impossible yeah. if we need yeah. to i can put it back up yeah <laughs> oh, okay um so yeah if you have any questions about that let us know but i think we should stay in our order just to keep yeah. chaos from raining um so i have james Rayley as the next question up yes hi how are you guys doing good oh, um you. so i just had two quick questions um first of all um the uh, you've shown some what we'd call dynamic forms, like you're working through TurboTax and you flip a checkbox and it wakes up two or three forms. Is there anything more exotic, calculated fields, business rules? You know, if they if if they use if somebody chose option four and form three, that it wakes up a required field and some other form. You know, something really sort of um, more complicated. Um, and then the other question is. Um, when the new system comes online, how do you anticipate handling the stuff in the old world? Uh, are you expecting to just have to, is this just another system that you're afraid you'll have to feed? Or are you hoping that it will be able to read the old stuff as well and, and presumably make it a nice, uh, I mean, that's what I would try for, but uh, didn't know what, where, where it landed in your requirements. That's a good question. Thanks. Um, Miles or Jennifer, did you want to? I guess yeah. I'll start or, uh, well, I'll, I'll say, I don't think the funding application information would need to be migrated. We, we do have, we have PDFs of all of that and we can go back and look at a physical application. Uh, the tip, we do want that to be migrated. I mean, we want to have access to all of our historical um, project information in the tip and um, and if and if the RTP database is migrated over, we would also want to, or you know, is is upgrade is part of this upgrade, we would want that to also be migrated. I guess that's my take, but Chris or Miles, tell me if you have a different take on this. Yeah, no, I feel largely the same way, um, especially with tip and RTP information. We're a public organization, so we still need to be able to make those records available to people. So either we'd want to move that information over to the new system and the new folder structure or the new file structure or database schema that we're using or to create some mechanism to still key into the existing structure that we have. Um, and back to the first part of your question, I don't think there's much more exotic in the forms than the dynamic form aspect. There are a few numeric controls that we use where if a sponsor indicates a total cost of a project in one field, we wanna check that they aren't exceeding that funding quantity in another field. Um, and I guess there are some calculated fields, like we calculate the total of funding in some places, um, but I don't think there's anything more than that. Well, let Chris agree. All right, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, we do, I mean, just, um, we, there's quite a bit of validation, or at least there used to be in, the, in that form of um, <laughs> so, requiring that people don't exceed such and such character limit in the description or, you know that that certain fields don't. You know that they agree with some previous answer that they've they've made. Um, but most of that is 
is not more complicated than than like making sure there's an at symbol in their email address and things like that. Cool. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Um, looks like the next question is Mike Rakowski. Close enough. Yep. Uh, Rachkowski or Razkowski or just Raz. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mike works quite well. Um, I'm with uh, Rico. Uh, you answered some of the questions uh, just like about volumes and throughput uh, users. Uh, to confirm, your internal staff is about 10 users, but your agencies have a unique user login as 80 users, not as involved. Would you hazard a guess as to how many of those are concurrent? Like at any one time, how many are connected of those 80 users? Oh, that's, um, Miles had have different idea of this, but um, it, it probably no more than half a dozen on most, uh, for the most times, except when we're doing funding applications and um, when it's near a big deadline and we have a hundred different uh, agencies that are all vying for funds then a lots of people will be in sort of, at least they'll be working on the web forums, whether that means that they're, um, they're refreshing the page or, um, I'm, I guess I'm not sure whether they maintain a, like we'll have a, an, an active database connection at that time or not, but the people, there will be flurries of activity where there are, like a hundred people um, working in our system at one time. Okay, well, hundred people is over the eighty. So yeah, that's why I wanted to. I mean, it's just a, it's over eighty. It's a bunch. It's I thought it was sort of on the same scale. Maybe I should say eighty. Um, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will kind the, of. There are multiple users at each of our sponsor agencies that use that login. Um, they aren't necessarily all using it at once, but it isn't that each agency has one user that uses our forum. Um, but I'd say agency have between one and four people that regularly use the login. Which, yeah, which is not, um, which we realize is probably not the best security practice yeah. out there. And it could, <laughs> that's subject to, that could be part of uh, a new system also, um, that um, it could be require people to, oh. to, to, to come up with their, you know, to apply for a new account. But uh, the advantage of that is that, say, King County has a few people that have submitted applications for different projects for a funding competition. Say they have three projects they're submitting and three different people have used their one login to create three applications. They can, they can all, they, they basically King County applications are all in one place, right? So the King County can see everything that's either in process or has been submitted um, for their agency, as opposed to having to know that this person did this application and this person over here did this application. Um, I, I think, especially with the larger agencies where they might have um, more than one person who are, um, and the same with the tip. I mean, the, the tip and an agency, I mean, that tends to be, you know, we don't have, we do have a tip deadline for the, we have an amendment deadline. So, you know, once a month is the deadline to submit your application for the tip. I don't think in generally we would have you know, dozens and dozens all at the same time. Just but one question, just on the, on the so, so generally about, uh, So generally, it might be along the lines of um, 20 connected on average, but on deadlines, you might be 200. Yeah, I think 200 would be high, but we have 80 agencies, right? So, I mean, we could yeah. have, we could definitely have several dozen do as we're approaching a deadline all in doing our thing at the same time. Okay. And, and, and it depends on the definition. It is, it is you know, web pages so they may be connecting and disconnecting depending on what they're filling out um but you know you've got 80 named users but the use named user is being shared so you might have one to four times as many per user 
depending on what they're doing. Yes. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, one more section I question, I guess, is how often, how many application forms do you have at any given time? I heard hundreds for projects and thousands for applications. Is are that? You, are you saying how many do we have in our system or? Well, at any given, there's going to be, pro, you know, there's going to be stuff you're holding on to, which are given projects, I guess, if I understand correctly. And then you've got applications that are going through the process of approval. Yeah. So Chris or Miles, feel free to well, um, put better words in my mouth. But uh, for an application, I mean, we, we, for like, say, a competition, we may have, we may have. 80 applications that get submitted for a, for a competition, for a funding competition. Um, but then once they're in our system, then they're just a record. I mean, we, we keep PDFs of the applications, but we don't have like online, um, we don't keep online forms of applications. Those applications are submitted. That's basically how that information is transferred to us, but we don't like maintain a history of all of the applications in our system. Am I saying that? correctly chris <laughs> yeah i mean we have we for for those web application systems we use an external host we use heroku um and we we try not to pay for the most expensive plan so that we have a, we have a limit to to how big that database can be for our um for our external uh web forms so we do try and call those periodically and just delete old um Old applications they they're not meant to persist once once a user uh, or a sponsor fills out an application and we download it and process it and copy that information into our internal database that's a kind of a dead application like they don't continue to update it or anything that's uh, that's just old. and we have a pdf of the application that's submitted and we have a, a file system for keeping track of the actual like PDF versions of their applications. And that's a, that's the second question. Is your accumulated applications that you're storing, that you're archiving, how many and how many pages? That's those PDFs. I don't know this is a oh. hard to estimate number, but is it well, the funding 10, thousand? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We What's have the number? About, <laughs> I feel like we have about 6,000 total projects active and historic in the database. So it wouldn't be more than that number of applications um, for in, in, for the TIP universe. And then each application is typically four to six pages. Um, I don't think I could give a great estimate on the funding application side, but there are thousands and thousands of applications and those tend to be between 10 and 20 pages. But the th not thousands and thousands. Oh, I mean, maybe since the start of our agency, but yeah. you know, in, a, in, in a, for our big competition, we might receive, because we actually have several, when I say the big competition, it's actually five competitions or six competitions. Yeah. And so the, for each of those, the app, the total applications may vary from, like for one of the smaller counties, they may have 20 applications that are submitted and the largest county may have a hundred applications that are submitted. So I would say in a given competition, we're probably looking at somewhere between one and 200 applications that are submitted for, for our big one. And then our smaller competitions would be generally fewer than 50 um, at, at, at any given time. Okay, so so if I understand correctly, what you know, I think you described it well, thank you. At any given time, you have less than 200 in the air. That's given, you know, competitions going on, busiest times in process going on your archive might be something on the order of you know two the two libraries 6000 of 4 to 6 pages and maybe 5000 of 10 pages yeah the funding yeah. competitions have they they those are longer applications it kind of depends yeah. on how long winded they are in their answers but they probably vary from 15 to 40 pages depending on what the <laughs> but that would include okay. attachments we also have up, uh, they upload maps they upload financial documentation so it's okay. uh, there there's attachments in addition to what they actually 
enter in the online form? Um, so that's the funding applications, which happens every two years, and we get like that many that we were just discussing. But there's also the monthly uh, amendments that are still going on as those funding applications or those funding processes are going on. There's yeah. still the every month they'd say, is it still on the order of maybe 30 projects coming through in a particular month? Um, yeah. yeah. Or the tip. So those all have forms. Um, and, and that, that's too. probably an average that 30. I mean, Miles, you I know you know that this so our range when when we're like a post funding competition, we might have as many as 100 tip applications in one amendment, but that's unusual, but it can happen. Yeah, 30 feels like a, a good average to peg us at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that gives a, a good uh, snapshot of the, the throughput volume and number of users. Thanks. All right. We're we're all, we're over two, but as long as people are willing to stick here, <laughs> we can stay for a little bit longer. And uh, like you said, we will make sure a recording of this is uh, available for anybody who, who needs to stop. Um, but with that, John Hunter. Hi, thank you. Uh, John Hunter from Chris Gale Solutions. Uh, first, thank you for putting this on and, and actually being so prepared uh, with what you want and the pain points and so forth. I've been to numerous of these vendor or bidders conferences, and this is a good one. Um, <laughs> numerous of my questions have already been answered with the, the prior people. So uh, let me just skip through my notes. Roughly, with, we're talking about the database. Can you give me a ballpark of the number of tables that are in your current database? Um, well... Roughly a hundred, I would say, but a lot of those we're hoping to just cull and not. I mean, this is a database that has uh, was started by some uh, some planners, I think, in 1992, as, as in some um, like within Access or some previous version of uh, a, a desktop kind of database system. And it's just been band-aided and added to over the years. Um, it's never been scrapped and uh, really uh, cl cleaned up. Um, so there's lots of information in there that we don't expect to keep. Um, but there, I would say there are um, there's maybe a dozen really central tables. Um, less than that. Um, for maybe half a dozen of actual, uh, basically fact tables, if you're thinking about it in uh, sure. Um, uh, okay, I mean, that, and then actually, lots of lookup tables. Okay, and then of those main twelve dozen, half dozen, however you want to um, describe them, how many columns are we talking about? Are they, you know, they're not like two hundred columns wide, or are they like twenty columns? Or, you know, just some of them have gotten. I mean, because some of those fields are. Um, mm -hmm. Are, are old and derelict we um they don't i don't think there's anything that's 200 columns wide um but i wouldn't be surprised if we have one or two have a hundred okay currently um i see they all, go ahead I, I will say that they did fit um when i came on board which was like 15 years ago um it um had everything fit in access requirements. So everything was sitting in an access database at that point. So I can't remember what the limitations were that access had at the time, but it was, there was not that many fields you could have in a particular table. So it's, it's grown a little bit since then, but not terribly. Uh, okay. So talking about the access database, it, uh, I think it looked like you have numerous reports that your, your access is generating the reports for you. There may be other places that you're generating reports. Can you give me a, a ballpark of the number of reports that whatever that replaces this will have to generate? Well, oh, um, I'm thinking, I can think of half, a, maybe half a dozen uh, miles. And Mitch, do you agree with that? I think. Yeah, I think there's maybe five or 10 reports that we produce on a really regular basis. And then there's, sort of as needed reports that we produce, but we use, we don't really use access for those. But I, I could like see us needing as many as like 10 to 20 reports 
to sort of reproduce what we do now. Yeah. But nothing more than much more than that scale, I'd say. For okay. lots of our internal needs, we uh, just generate our own SQL queries to come up with uh, sort of ad hoc, uh, to respond to ad hoc data requests and and internal uh, internal questions. So, I mean, some of those types of things are pretty regular types of work that could be transferred into the um, into reports if if we had the ability to, but so far it's just easier to run these uh, SQL queries that we then maybe copy and paste into a, a spreadsheet here and pretty it up somehow. So there's uh, just the fact that we only have four to a dozen uh, reports right now. Um, that answered my question, yeah. Okay. Um, in the RFP, you collectively you describe uh, phase one, two, and three. Phase one being kind of this uh, design and architecture and, and figuring out what it is you want to build. <clears throat> and then it says, you know, with whatever's left over remaining, that's what phase two will be is that that progress towards implementation. Is your expectation or or can you talk to the expectation of how far along do you think that the proposed budget will get you towards your system? And then it didn't say that phase three is funded yet. So is it possible you're going to get to this, you know, this area where you you have a half-built system and, and now what? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it was a little bit, yeah, it, it's, we, we recognize that it's a little bit clunky. Part of it is because we do want, this phase one is really important to us is just, just mm -hmm. have, have somebody who gets to know our system's needs and how we, how we use our system and, uh, and really, we're very interested in just learning what's out there. What are our options? Um, and but we are hoping for the budget that we have authorized, this hundred and fifty thousand, that we can that there's some other value that can be added to this beyond just kind of identifying what the next system is going to be. Um, but where that line is, I mean, that's where that that's what we're really hoping to hear in kind of what 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 you all think of like what what can we how how much time and expense and effort is needed to really get to know the system and really come up with what our options are for moving forward. What we'd like to know is, how, you know, how much can we actually progress can we make for the 150,000 that is the budget that we have authorized, but we do recognize and think it's probably not going to be a complete overhaul for the budget that we have. And so really that is the point of the phase one is to kind of get to the bottom of that and and we would have to go through a budget process. Um, this, I mean, this is really central part of our function as an, as an MPO. So, um, so we're not, we're not concerned about that if we have to go and, and, you know, request in, in, in the new budget, in the next biennium budget, kind of whatever phase three is, you know, we are publicly funded. We want to kind of get the most we can for the budget that, that we have available. Um, but that, ex that exploration and really finding out what our options are and what the cost implications are and, you know, maybe there is something where this is a Cadillac option and this is what it's going to cost you. This is a, you know, of a less than a Cadillac option where you're still going to need to do this. That That's really the conversation we are hoping to have at the end of phase one. But we, we, we just recognize we can't really explore that thoroughly without spending some of our budget having, you know, whoever, whoever takes us on really getting to know our system and our needs. So I don't, <laughs> did that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I mean, I appreciate the transparency. Um, it's good yeah. to know that you've thought through it and so forth. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I froze because I. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say we're, we're unless I mean, it's great if somebody comes in and says we can we can do this for 150,000 and we only need a phase two. You know, we want to have that conversation, but we do expect that um, part of this discussion is how much how far in, in this overhaul can we get with, with basically our current budget? And then what is what is the time and budget that would be needed to kind of get us to the finish line? Or what are the options for getting to the finish line? Um, that would all be part of the kind of post phase one discussion. I'm not sure that it, it might not matter. So if it doesn't, you can just say it doesn't really matter. But so if you started using access in 92 for this application and, and we've gone you know 30 years, 
why now? What what triggered the the idea that you you're going to go out to bid and, and try and replace this system? Uh, I spend the longer history of this with me. Uh, so I can try to answer that first. <laughs> this has been like a long dream of mine to get out of the access <laughs> world. It's just it's not that it uh, we probably since ninety three. <laughs> Well, since whenever he started here, <laughs> and you know, the farther along we get, the the less access seems to work for us, um, and the, the more and more it becomes like the next time we. Um, I don't think it's even supported by Microsoft anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So um, it's more. It's not like something changed and happened in in one particular event. It's just a uh, just okay. It's just something fine, that, fine. that's being discussed for as long as I've been at PSRC and we just have kind of the the budget and the staff energy to um, just start making this happen, this thing that we've been talking about for a very long time. And um yeah. and and the and honestly, I guess Chris, you can weigh in this. The 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 system we have right now is fairly niche as far as the technical information, especially where we hire our consultant. And so it just feels like that's not going to get any easier as time goes on, <laughs> finding that 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 set of skills that we need to um, update our current system. So we also don't want to be in a position where we're just beyond where we have options for for our system that, that we currently have. I don't know. Is that a fair thing to say, Chris? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think so. Okay. okay. Uh, one last question, and then I'll, I'll be done. Um, uh, I, I don't remember where it was exactly. Something about uh, women-owned businesses. Are is there any? How are, Is there any uh, favor? Not favoritism, preference for you know minority or women-owned businesses in in this RFP, and how is that factored into scoring? I. We we do not have a requirement on this. I mean, we sir, I think we've I think whatever the wording in the RFP is what I would go by. I mean, if um, I mean we encourage it. I think if you do have either a, a woman owned business or a disadvantaged business, a DBE that is part of your team, let us know. But it's not something that's explicitly part of our scoring criteria or okay. a requirement of. Um, of this particular RFP. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. I'll just Hi. Say how you doing? Thank <laughs> you for thank you for sticking around for an extra half an hour. It's been very very informative. Uh, just to piggyback a little bit off of John and what he was saying in relationship to the RFP with Phase One and Phase Two, I realize that you folks are quasi government in terms of dealing with with the with the DOT and the counties and things like that. In terms of funding and acquisition, do you or have you acquired or buy off of the NASPO Washington State contract uh, to take advantage of, of pricing? Are, are you familiar or have you done that in the past? I am not familiar. I'm not um, familiar. With probably have to <laughs> talk to our finance folks. <laughs> okay, just just a question. I know that the um, the state puts out uh, contracts through the Department of Enterprise Services uh, uh, that are competitively bid RFPs for pricing, and that state agencies have the ability to, and and uh, government entities have the ability to buy off of that NASBO. Washington state contract to get better funding. So I was just trying to find out if you folks have used that or or would would contemplate utilizing the capability of buying off of that. That is not something that's been part of our conversation. I mean, we, we kind of know what our budget is and what right. we're really interested in is our, you know, what is the kind of, what is, what is the approach that that different folks would have, would propose to us for kind of figuring out the the best way to spend that that money and whatever money is needed beyond it to kind of achieve our objectives? Super. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we went a half an hour over, but I don't see any other questions. Um, so I was 
Oh. Jennifer, I was going to ask if we did have more questions, but we just, I mean, you guys have been so gracious with your time. Is it okay if we just follow up via email? Yeah. So if you, yes, you can follow up via email, any questions that are submitted via email, please submit, please send them to Liana Lopez, whose contact information is on the RFP and any questions that are submitted via email. When we provide responses, we will provide responses to everybody who's basically inter registered interest in this proposal. Um, so. Okay. Um, Thank you. But yes, if you do, I was actually, thank you for asking that. I was going to let you know if you do have questions, you can email them to Liana and we will just send everybody responses to the questions. And I guess we don't, we didn't put like a hard timeline on that, but we do have a batch of questions. So maybe we'll wait a couple of days, see if any other questions come in after today and uh, try to get some responses out to everybody by like early next week, probably. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. I think mostly my questions are around like the scoring and understanding a little bit more detail around that. But, um, that's fine as a follow-up too. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Well, thanks for your time and thanks for your interest. We're, you know, we're really excited to move forward on this. So <laughs> looking forward to seeing, seeing your proposals on this. So, uh, Thank you once again. And yeah, if you, there's any other information you need, uh, just make sure you send that to Liana Lopez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank time. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank it. Everybody. Thank you much guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.